Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you guys know about an opportunity to learn some of the most important skills in life, if not the most important skills. And those are the skills of learning and doing so rapidly, effectively, and easily. You see, guys, I'm putting on a completely free 60-minute webinar that you guys can check out where I will be going into my absolute best memory tips, learning tips, and speed reading tips so that you can immediately begin applying them and accelerating your learning of anything and everything. All you need to do to claim your spot in this free webinar is visit jle.vi slash webinar. We have showings at many different times throughout the days for every time zone, but you have to log in and claim your spot. So that's jle.vi slash webinar. And I really look forward to seeing what you guys achieve. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You guys, one of the only things that every nutritional expert that we've had on the show seems to actually agree on is that we all need to eat more vegetables, eat more greens, eat organic, cut out all the processed junk. Well, who has the time, right? Who has the time to go out, do the shopping, make the salads, make the juices, make the smoothies? And that's what I love so much about Organifi. Their product is an all organic green juice. It has all of the nutrients that you need. It tastes absolutely amazing. And it's made by wonderful people who I consider to be personal friends. And as listeners of this show, you guys can actually save 20% on your first order. And all you have to do is go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and use the coupon code superhuman at checkout. Greetings, super friends, and welcome back to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. Before we get into the thick of it, I want to thank Ash Hill from the United Kingdom for an amazing five-star review titled, An All-Around Awesome and Inspiring Podcast. Jonathan is a brilliant interviewer who clearly listens to his guests and asks intelligent and insightful questions to give us listeners the information we really want to hear from them. He mixes it up nicely with a wide variety of guests and has helped me improve on things that I never thought I would get from a podcast, such as piano, flow, and much more. It's helped me change aspects of my life for the better, and I'm very grateful for what you're doing. Keep up the good work, Ash. Well, Ash, I'm very grateful for what you're doing, which is taking what you learn in this podcast and actually applying it and making the world and your world a better place. So thank you for that. Thank you for the review. And for anyone who hasn't left a review, please do look at how excited it gets me. On to today's episode, you guys. Today, we are joined by a superstar by the name of Danielle Laporte. She is the author of three nonfiction books, including her newest one, White Hot Truth. She is one of Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul 100 leaders, and she's also a very popular blogger and thought leader. She has a top 10 iTunes app. Her One of her books has been translated into eight languages. I can't really keep up with her bio. She's amazing. And you guys are going to see that. And in this episode, we talk about stuff that we haven't covered on the show and a lot of stuff that we've covered, but not in the same way. The stuff that we haven't covered is a little bit on gender dynamics and what we as men, most of you in the audience, men, but what men like me can do to avoid a lot of no-nos. Let's just put it that way. Avoid a lot of no-nos and avoid being patronizing. And also what you women in the audience can do and, and where that boundary is between speaking up for yourself and creating boundaries and healthy defense. We also talk a lot about very interesting things, in fact, like psychedelics, like business leadership, and much, much more. I'm going to make you guys listen to the whole episode to get the full scoop. I really enjoyed this episode. Danielle was kind enough to say that she really enjoyed this episode, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce you guys to my new super friend, Ms. Danielle Laporte. (laughs) 
Danielle, welcome to the show. I am so excited to finally meet you. Mm, thank you. Hello from Vancouver to Tel Aviv. Love this already. Yeah, I imagine it's a little bit colder where you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm West Coast Canada, right? So, oh, that's not bad. I mean, there's not an obvious comparison between Tel Aviv, but it's not like it's not snowing. The crocuses are coming up. People are starting to like you know, just wear t-shirts. So it's lovely. It's spring. That is fantastic. So Danielle, I feel embarrassed asking you for an intro because I feel like everyone in our audience should know who you are, but there's always going to be that one guy who's been living under a rock until last week. So let me get the the 30,000 foot view of what you answer when people say, what do you do? (laughs) Well, first of all, thank you for that. Because when I get this question, I'm just like, really? Not that everybody should know me, but like, it's, there's been a lot that's happened. It's a terrible question. Yeah. Okay. Here's, and I was actually thinking about last night, like, what if this is the opener? Cause I have to like lose my resentment and cynicism around this and just be like, I'm here. Let's really be here. I heard a whole talk on how to answer this question for people in the expert space, in the blogging space. Like, how do you actually answer that question when you're like, well, I write books, but I podcast, but I teach online courses. And I also have a one-year program. So I'll send it to you. You'll like it. Okay. And maybe you can like tell me here. Here's what I'm going to say this morning. I am really interested in conversations, you know, both literal and figurative around consciousness, around sacred activism. I am most well known in terms of being a quote unquote, it's important to put that in quotes, personality that is, you know, I'm really straight up. I try and take really esoteric things and make them really accessible highly opinionated. And really at the end of the day, for me, it's all about love being the right thing to do all the time. In terms of what I've put out in the world, I'm most well known for a book called The Desire Map, which is about a feelings-based, an internal-based approach to getting clear on what you want and creating, again, quotes, goals with soul. Yeah. And I speak, you know, with the microphone, I put my high heels on And I do that mostly for people I consider to be tribe. So that's self-helpers, wellness community. It's a lot of women. And I write. I love that. I Mm. love that. And I love that that we didn't get the standard Wikipedia bio. I appreciate it. You did. Because I had to get over my shit about that. So... (laughs) So I, I should thank it. you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to like be fresh with that. All right. I love it. And you know what? I'll commit to you to ask not my standard questions and you can commit to give not your standard answers and we'll make it not a standard interview. I'm happy to make that commitment. <laughs> okay. So tell me, how did you get into all this? I mean, for I find for people like myself, there's a turning point in your life where something happens mm. and you go, wait a minute, I need to change the way that I'm living my life. And then shortly thereafter, or a long time thereafter, it becomes hold on, I can help other people. So what was that turning point for you? Well, I always wanted to help people. I always felt like I'm on a path. I don't know if it's the path, but I'm on a path, very service directed. But a turning point for me to become who I am now was about, it's nine years ago now, 10 years ago. I had co-founded a company with a really good friend and Oprah had called. And so we went and raised a bunch of money based on, wow. you know, what we thought was going to be big publicity. And I got all these quote, angel investors. There's no such thing as an angel investor. <laughs> and I hired a dude CEO. It's important to mention that, mm-hmm. you know, that person was male because it was a female supposedly led company. And I got fired from my own business. So I got Steve jobbed. And it was, you know, it was like my name and somebody else's name on the website. It was my name. I actually had a parking spot with a, like a, you know, a plaque. And that was over in a blink. So there's two ends of that story. One end is that business, you know, three months after canning me declared insolvency because, you know, karma. And then that was really the beginning of me being more of me. I mean, I learned to be more of me every day, but I started my own thing and have not looked back. And I really, I started writing my books. Yeah, no more co-authoring. I just became Danielle. That is awesome. I'm glad you took the moment to emphasize 
you know, that it was a female run company and that there is a tendency of not just mansplaining, but man leading. I think that yeah. happens. And I, I saw this when I was, you're going to laugh, but I was interning at a family office angel investor. And I would see <laughs> these teams of super bright women come in. And I remember one of them specifically, I won't name the name, but it was a platform for uh, women specifically sharing fashion and I won't get too specific so people don't know. They actually ended up succeeding, mm -hmm. but they came in and it was two very, very smart women co-founders and the male CEO they brought in. And I was like, so is he like a fashionista? They're like, no, he's a business guy. I was like, does he understand women's fashion at all? And like, no, but he's a business guy. And I just felt like, come on, what's this guy doing in this room? You guys don't need him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I still recently, had, just so I don't give it away, let's just say within the last two years, I was in, let's call it a boardroom. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this individual who was male proceeded to tell me. So let me just give a little bit of context here. This is the stuff, you know, that goes into my bio that I would never say, but it's important for this story. Sure. You know, I have millions of people who come to my website every month. I've sold hundreds of thousands of books. My team in the personal development space is one of the best in terms of marketing and integrity. And then it's up to me to be in creative integrity and create, you mm -hmm. know, stuff that is useful, right? So dude is telling me how I identify who my market is <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what I might want to weed out of my business so that I can focus Wow. and, you know, really getting clear on who my customer avatar is. Yeah. Wow. Like they're not actually, you know, I'm not, I'm not actually highly functioning in these areas. Right. Like they've never crossed my mind. Totally. But here's the important part of that story. I was seething inside and you know, your body knows, right? I start to, I'm in one of those wheelie chairs and I, I can, I'm starting to push away from the table. I cross my legs. Uh -huh. I'm nodding. My breathing's changing across my arms. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to be rude. I never want to be rude. I am kind. But there's that place in a woman's brain where you go, don't offend him. It's right. dangerous to offend him. Then you really start to justify things. There's a lot on the line here. There's nothing on the line there. <laughs> I mean, there's totally. just me being really frustrated. Yeah. And I would just nodded. Uh huh. Quiet. And I thanked him. And, you know, maybe that was the right thing to do because it just is part of, I don't know, the relationship did what the relationship needed to do over the course of a couple of years, the professional relationship. But sometimes, you know, hindsight, I think I just should have stood up and said, are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> are you familiar with uh, the joy junkie, Amy Smith? Have you seen her stuff? No. We had an interesting conversation, Amy and I, just about you know, how much of biting your tongue is still honest versus diplomacy and that fine line that you play where it's like, if someone was saying something blatantly sexist, you would have been kind of morally obligated to stand up and say, hey, that's not okay. But if it's on that line, like at what point do you, do you make a comment? I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. And you can also, you know, in that individual, I can see his intention. He's not a bad guy. There's right. nothing malicious about that. He's trying to be helpful. This is his paradigm. This is how he was mentored in this ironic way. He's got my best interests at heart. He right. just doesn't have the skill to be sensing and hearing and feeling into who he's talking to and right. what's really going on in that meeting. Yeah, that's the shortcoming. It's wake up, see that you don't have the skills, see what the missing is yeah. and go get that skill so we can really engage. Yeah. And I'm glad that you said that because my audience, for one reason or another, I can't figure out why, but is majority male. And I think it's something that we men need to hear because I will catch myself a lot of times like talking to women in a different way than I talk to men. And I think that's okay. I like to use humor more with women than men. But if it comes to a point where you're explaining something to someone because they're a woman and you think that she must not understand. So in your example, no one has ever sat me down and talked to me about my customer avatar because people just assume I get it. You know, whereas if I were a woman, mm. it, it may very well be that someone would have that conversation. And it, 
I want to point out to the gentleman in the audience, you know, be really aware of that because it, it's kind of a form of mansplaining. I don't know if it's mansplaining or man leading or whatever it is, but I think it's an important point to make. I can tell you why your audience is male. Tell me. You're a dude. I am a dude. And you're talking about, I mean, we'll just put it in this bucket of intellectual excellence Mm -hmm. and a kind of cerebral prowess. I mean, superhuman, right? Absolutely. And that is, it's not exclusively a man trait, practice, domain characteristic, but that is the masculine domain. Yeah. And, you know, I'm interested in being a whole person. So I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in, well, love transcends all of it and incorporates all of it. You know, I identify as a predominantly feminine creature, Mm -hmm. as a woman. Yeah. So that means my strength, where I am most joyful, where I am most powerful and effective and effectual, two different things, is when I am in the state of flow and intuition and engaged listening and sensuality. Mm -hmm. And I apply those things to my business. So it's like, for me, you know, it's like two thirds, the feminine, one third, the masculine is, you know, there's mm-hmm. times to the go-getter, the hunter, the, the go-getter, the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's I right. It's, that. uh, the hunter is such a great metaphor for that masculine energy, but I prefer most of the time, if I have to hunt, I'll hunt and I'll get it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ironically, as a woman, I'm a hunter when I shop, I just walk into the, the <laughs> foyer of a store and I can think, there's All no business. kill here. <laughs> <laughs> There's not, I don't smell it. I'm out. But mostly I want to receive. So my job, my job as me, as female, is to be radiant. Mm-hmm. Radiant with my knowledge, radiant with my offerings, radiant in my visual brand, mm-hmm. radiant yeah, in how I show up. And it comes to me. And then everyone's well, yeah, I got to. Hunt it down. I love that. So I want to ask a tough question because I promised to give you not the questions you're used to getting a, a million times. <laughs> and you talked about something that I thought was very, very interesting, which is that you look at the world love centric, right? Love comes first and is above yes. all. And so I want to ask, you know, I don't want to ask you to summarize all of your books standing on one leg, but I want to ask, you know, what is the Daniel Laporte worldview that has garnered you such a huge following and such a a passionate following. And what would you say? I mean, how would you sum up the wisdom that you're sharing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think two things create interest. One is, you know, the substance of what you're delivering, what you're saying. And then there's the, how you say it. So for me, I'm real and transparent and I'm also a very private person. That's my business, but Basically, I walk through the world like I'm everybody's girlfriend. Like, this is what I'm going through right now. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to lose and everything to gain by telling you the truth of how difficult it was in my business last year. The things I've lost, how I failed, how I've won, how pleased and proud I am of what's working. And so there's that. The what, the honey of what I'm talking about, the love of it is... The best self-help is self-compassion. Yes. That is a spiritual practice. And when you are in that place, there's three levels to this. And when you're in that place, you will have the desire to serve. And then I am standing up. I'm, I'm taking the, like, the little speck of leadership that I have in this space to say, I'm asking you to stand up and serve. It's getting really short in the cosmic day. The earth is in some serious peril and Mm -hmm. we really need you to get your shit together, love thyself and love thy neighbor. And we need to engage. We don't have time for materialism and greed and bullshit campaigns about how you can make your first million dollars. I'm so tired of it. Right. I love that. I love every aspect of that. And it also, you know, I I have a course on helping other people spread their message and and helping them create courses and podcasts. And I always say the beauty of the internet is that everyone can get exactly what they want. And and there are so many 
different voices and different messages. And I've heard the same, I don't want to say the same message, but this is a recurring theme of self-love and self-awareness being the center. And there's literally, you can't hear it enough times and in enough different ways because there, there are so many people, and I think especially people in, in our audience who tend to beat themselves up because I didn't wake up at six o'clock this morning and I skipped my workout and I chose French fries instead of the salad and, 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 and I love this approach and I've only recently learned it from a female in my life, which is that it starts with self-love and self-compassion. And that's where you get to really make lasting change. I love that. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction to be made between self-love and self-compassion. Like self-compassion is medicine and it's really difficult to apply. Like there's a surface level of self-love out there. You know, it's the self-care yeah. Sundays and, and I'm all for that, but there is so much more. Self-compassion, the stuff that's really going to change you and how you live your life is when you can show up for yourself and apply love and understanding to yourself when you hate yourself, when you have severely messed mm. up, when you have the secret you don't want anybody to know. And if you can... Forgive yourself and hold yourself in the way that whoever you perceive to be God would hold you or your best friend would hold you. That's transmutation. And it's very difficult to do. And you need to have, I'll just put this in the most general language, you need to have a wellness support system in place mm -hmm. to be able to create the medicine of compassion for yourself. And without that medicine of compassion, you can't really fully love yourself. And this is where like depression creeps up. Right. And rage. I mean, depression is really undealt with rage. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of other things. I don't want to oversimplify it, but yeah. I love what you just said so much. One of my favorite podcast episodes of all time was Naval Ravikant on Tim Ferriss's show. And he talks about this idea that depression is a new a new occurrence in humanity, you know, maybe over the last 5,000 years, because prior to that, we were in tribes. I, I love the way you used tribes before. We were in tribes of people and you didn't have enough solitary time and you didn't have enough privacy to be depressed. Like if you were in a network of people that is your immediate family and your friends and your kin and your tribe, it's pretty hard to have the alone brooding time to be depressed because there's always going to be someone there, as you said, a, a support system, a support network working you through it. Would you agree with that? That's some complex stuff. 5,000 years is a long time. I <laughs> think there's a lot to unpack in that. It's like, you know, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, people are really in a much more fundamental kind of survival mode, life mm -hmm. expectancy. I mean, if you made it to 50, you were ancient. <laughs> you know, they're dying from an infected tooth. So the way I look at it is, you know, their consciousness isn't enabling them to go to the place where they might be depressed. You were just, you're on the track of surviving. Okay. So the perspective that you can't be depressed because you have that support system. Yeah. I think there's a lot to that. There's meaningfulness happening. There's loving interactions. Yeah. There's the healing of community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I got to That's a big one. Yeah, and I, I think the emphasis is less around the time, but more around this idea of us moving into cities, moving into smartphones. And I think in recent years, people aren't living with their family as long. You know, we have this period of life where we move out from our parents' home and then we're alone at, before we create our own family, which I think is a relatively new thing. And, and just yeah. the idea of being able to be in a city of 5 million people and yet go home after work and be so alone, I think is a new phenomenon in humanity. Yeah, I agree. I think loneliness is making us sick. I think technology is making us even sicker. And I'm really, I mean, what I'm focused on for the next 18, 24 months is there's a handful of intentions that I want to help people with, but one of them is to get into right relationship with technology. And I've been having this conversation with my girlfriends the last couple of months, just developing 
what I'm working on. And it's like really basic. Like I don't read a book anymore. When I'm sad, I go to bed and I just get on Instagram, all right. the comparing that's happening. My texting is dinging off and I'm not hearing what my partner and my kids is saying, are saying to me. And it's toxic. And I think it's, this is happening to a pandemic degree. It's a I real agree. problem. I don't even know what we can compare it to. It's like, you know, we discovered cancer cells. This is as, to use an overused word, this is as epic in proportion, our addiction to technology. I agree. I agree completely. And this is something that has come up throughout the podcast with a lot of the highest achievers that we talk to. And every time I think I know a lot and I say, oh yeah, I don't, you know, I, I check my emails only twice a week and they go, okay, yeah, but do you get text? You know, they, they take it to the next level for those in the audience listening, particularly check out our episode with Noah Kagan, because Noah's really, really good about this. But I'd love to hear, bring me a fly on the wall in some of those conversations. What are the strategies that you're taking, Danielle, to rein it in, you know? Yeah. Well, I've actually started to look at the 12 step program in relation to just phone addiction. I, mm. I mean, there's so much, the technology is pervasive, but f for myself and my friends, it's our f***ing iPhones, right? Yeah. And what's one of the first steps? It meant you have a problem. And actually one of the most helpful books <laughs> with all of this has been Russell Brand's work because he's really, you know, he's so cheeky. It's like, number one, are you f***ing? Number two, can you admit that you could be on <laughs> Number three, you know, admit your <laughs> And for the actual practices and admitting that you have an addiction problem. I was talking to a friend who just got out of rehab yesterday afternoon about this and how, you know, there's certain s situations he cannot put himself in because there's way if they're too tempting. And last week I came across, I hope this is good to plug because I don't really know them, but just this is what's happening in my life. There's a phone that's being developed called the light phone. Oh, and there's yeah. light phone one and light phone two, right? So I just jumped in and like supported the Kickstarter for the light phone two. And so basically it's a small handheld phone. And the only thing you can do with it is incoming outgoing calls and texts. That's the 2.0, the 1.0, you can only do phone calls. Right. And the beauty of this, and this is why everybody wants to, they're lining up to buy it, is that it's connected to your current telephone number on your current device. So you don't have to right. get another. Okay. Right. So I signed up to buy that. And I was saying to my friend with respect to the conversation on addiction, I'm like, I feel like such a fool because I'm just, I'm going to buy this other thing because I'm addicted to my current thing. If I had more willpower, I just wouldn't <laughs> engage with my iPhone in an addictive manner. Right. But the reality is I have an addiction situation happening. Yes. My dopamine, I know my brain knows where it's getting its dopamine and it keeps going there. So I need to treat my phone like my friend who just got out of rehab treats a bar and I yes. need to not go in it. So I'm going to do the responsible thing. <laughs> I hope. Right. And I'm going to get this lighter phone. And right. Yeah. I have two comments on that. One is I just finished reading a book called The Willpower Instinct, which actually helped me with a lot of other things like waking up early. Kelly McMonagall. Yeah, exactly. A friend of mine just wrote a book called Willpower Doesn't Work. And the whole premise is exactly what you're saying is don't test your willpower because we as humans are not structured to have willpower. And, and to that end, I was in a room with a bunch of CEOs of multi-million dollar companies and one of them, Joe Polish, mentioned that he is mm -hmm. this week getting an entirely separate iPhone, which he's not allowed to install apps on. It will not have an app store account. It's only there for, you know, if he wants to take pictures while he's out on his walk and take calls and text. And every single one of us in the room go, oh my God, that's a genius idea. I need to do that. We mm -hmm. all write it down, you know, as a to do. So this is a real thing. And I would encourage people listening, really take a, a good hard look at your use of your smartphone. You know, that reminds me, I actually have, see, this is part of the addictive personality. I have a younger generation iPhone that I was like, oh, I need the seven because the camera and the resolution. Right. <laughs> and I've got the other one. I was like, oh, I can't be bothered to sell it. I was sitting, I should just fire that up right now just to use for in the Joe Polish way. Yeah. Right. But you know, 
here's a, a theory that fits in with this about willpower working versus it not working. One of my favorite quotes, ideas, theories that really was a true aha for me, really changed how I approach my life is from Krishnamurti. He's my philosophical. Yeah, J. Krishnamurti? Yes, yes. He's an incredible mystic. And it's this, discipline is a tool that numbs the mind. Discipline is a tool that numbs the mind. So if you put this in the context of willpower, and by the way, I, you know, I'm a big fan of Kelly McMonagall's work, but if you put that in the context of willpower, basically that's what he's saying is willpower doesn't work. Right. And so what I'm trying to do is live in that more fluid state where I'm not having a robotic default response because I made a verbal social commitment to be disciplined about something. This is why accountability groups don't work for me. I'm like, look, I'm hard enough on myself. Today, if I, my body says I need to sleep, I will sleep. Today, if I want to get up at sunrise, I will get up at sunrise. And in my personal experiences, that takes a lot more self-awareness, at least yes. on my behalf, than it does to, well, let me use another word. It takes a lot more energy <laughs> and consciousness to be present with what I'm needing in that moment, right. then it requires energy to, to stick to shit, <laughs> you know? And right. I don't want to do anything. Life is hard enough. I think we can all agree on that. I don't want anything, nothing in my life to even have the hint, the whiff of punishment, nothing. So when I get on my elliptical to sweat, in the mornings when I feel like that's the thing that my body wants to do, I do that with zero resentment to prove nothing. I do it for the joy of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I push myself, of course, but that's the space I want to live in. I think that's wise. And doing it for the joy or also sometimes what I'll do is I'll say, you know what, I really don't want to go to the gym right now. But I know, you know, and, and getting into that mindset of, I always have that two to three hour post gym high, you know, that it, I just feel amazing. So sometimes I'll focus on that and really reframe things from a punishment to a reward of, yes. oh, and then I'm going to have that hot shower and oh my God, there's no shower in the world better than a post gym shower. I don't care what anybody <laughs> yeah. says. I've spent a week in the desert, not showering and those showers still aren't as good as a, a post gym <laughs> shower. It's, it's reverent. And yes. so, I'll, you know, I'll reframe, but I love that idea of, of just listening to your body. It really comes back to what you were saying earlier, which is just have some compassion for yourselves. Yes. And know how you want to feel. I, this is the heart of the art of so much of what I write about. I mean, desire mapping is you get clear on what I call your core desired feelings. There's a really easy way to do that. I think most of us have three to five primary states of being that we, we want to feel the most. And once you get clear on that, then everything becomes, those are generative. Like everything is in service to generating those feelings. So early in the morning, when I'm resisting going to get my sweat on, I go back to my core desired feelings. And right now, mm -hmm. one of them is euphoric or euphoria. I, I got to refine that. But I think, well, if I go out and get on my elliptical, I walk through the rain, I get there. It's going to lead me to euphoria. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go do it. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I want to ask you, I wanted specifically to ask you about white hot truth because it talks about the culture of self-help and personal growth and you know, the space that you and I are both in. If we already covered a lot of it, we already covered it, but I do want to ask your take and what White Hot Truth is and give you an opportunity to talk about it. The premise is, I've hit it, which is the best self-help is self-compassion. And really, it's my take on how the self-help movement, all the practices, if we're not careful, can turn into self-criticism. It's actually backfiring mm -hmm. on us in a way. Mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about, this is not a phrase that I coined. I wish I did. It's brilliant. I talk a lot about spiritual bypassing. 
which is the work of a psychologist named John Wellwood and another psychologist, uh, Robert Augustus Masters. And that spiritual bypassing is the idea that we're taking all these harmonious, beautiful, self-help, new age, looks great in yoga pants, loving, good deed kind of things to avoid and to cover up, to bypass all of the ugly things that we don't think we have deemed to be unspiritual and not inspiring and not high performing, like rage, like anger, like sexual abuse, like jealousy, like not wanting to forgive. And you cannot, you cannot bypass those things and be well. They will come to get you. <laughs> Whatever right. is repressed will find a way <laughs> and you will get signals. You will get in a little car accident. You will get depressed. You will throw out your back. Whatever it is, you will get dumped. So we need to go to those ugly places to be whole. And, you know, there's always beauty to be found there. And sometimes, actually, that's not true. There's not always beauty to be found there, but there's always beauty to be found in the journey, <laughs> you know, right. and in coming back from the ugly place. So, you know, that's my version of getting real. I like that a lot. And there's so much there. And I definitely identify, a younger me would have definitely identified with the growing at all costs, but leaving a, kind of a mess behind and not doing the actual work. And I, sometimes I hate when people use that phrase, do the work, but it, it really is work. It really is work. To get into your childhood, to get into your body image. I mean, it's work. And I wanted to ask you, I, I have a friend who gave me a quote one time when I was on a psychedelic trip, if we're being honest, mm -hmm. and talking about spiritual work and how, you know, I asked her, have you ever experienced what I'm seeing right now? And she said, not exactly, but there are many ways to roll down that hill, mm -hmm. which I thought was really profound. And I wanted to ask you, what are some of your favorite ways to roll down the hill of personal growth and development? I know you do a lot on meditation. So yeah. elaborate on that. And, and what are some of the other things that you've found you know, to do that work. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about psychedelics for a minute. I would love to. Yeah. I have some very strong opinions about it these days. I gathered you might. <laughs> what I do to roll down that hill is I meditate. I'm reluctant to call myself a meditator because I think it's another label that a lot of us claim so that we look more spiritual. I know a lot of people who are meditators and they're still assholes. So <laughs> I try to be kind and not be an asshole. I meditate on a regular basis. And for me, that's, sometimes I'll be on a roll and it's every day for many weeks. And then, you know, like right now I'm in this really intense creative production phase. You know, I've got like six weeks to launch kind of mode. So my meditations are shorter they're five days a week, and I just try and give it all I've got when I sit. Mm -hmm. I have a prayer practice. Prayer is different than meditation, and I am really contemplative. Contemplation is different than prayer and meditation. So there's that. I'm always, I have a regular commitment to basically rinsing my psyche, washing my brain, getting shit out of my mind that I don't want there. I use meditation to be of service. You know, it's a light practice. Like I'm, I'm trying to send light to the pain points in the world. I use gratitude in a meditative way to thank all of the elements that are keeping us alive, mm -hmm. earth, water, air, light, all of it. Thank you. These things that we abuse. So there's that. I move my body in a way, and there's things I do just for fitness, but I try to move in a way where I'm having like a sacred communion with life for me. That's yoga. Not all yoga mm. is sacred communion, but I'm not just there like, so my ass looks great. I'm there to just really hear what's going on and to get the prana moving. Like it's really, it's all energy. And my girlfriends are my religion. I don't like to use the word work, but I do put in the work to my friendships. And sometimes I fail miserably and I'm not there when I'm needed and I don't do the things I say I'm going to do. I don't always call you back. But really, my friends are on the altar of my life. Relationships are everything. Yeah. That's a really important point as well. Talk to me about psychedelics. Now I have to know. Yeah. Not into it. 
I'll tell you, and I've done my share of psychedelics. I'll tell you why I'm not into it. So I have a, a teenage son, young, 14. And I was just having a conversation with him recently about this. And context here, so double context. I've done a lot of psychedelics myself. And I'm living in a province where just weed is on every corner. Mm-hmm. See, everybody's doing what, yeah. And this has been, it's not just legalization of everything now in BC and Canada, but this is the pot capital of the world next to Amsterdam. Right. And, you know, I told my kid, if this were 10 years ago, he has no interest in drugs right now. If he did, I'd be very concerned. He's 14 and it's not the life we lead. But I said, look, if this were 10 years ago, and, you know, you were 18-ish, I'd be saying, yeah, go smoke some weed experimentally and see what's going on. I don't even think my kids should experiment with that right now. I think what's happening is we've taken drugs so far out of their sacred context. Ayahuasca mm. and just say that whole genre of psychotropics. It's been so watered down and fractured and splintered in its lineage in its accessibility, in the way, the reasons that it's used. And now I'm going to get really esoteric. I think it's creating entry points and portals for a lot of darkness to come into people's psyches. Yes. There is light in the universe. There is dark in the universe. That dark is always looking for a way in. And I think we become very porous. I think those types of drugs have become dangerous in a way, in a psycho-spiritual way, in greater degrees and ways that they weren't before. So when I go somewhere and I hear that Todd from Venice Beach is becoming a shaman, right? I want to barf. Agreed. And if you look at life through a multidimensional lens, I mean, to put this in the crassest way, if you believe in past lives, and that you're going to live in many incarnations and many dimensions, then there's a lot to be said for the value of lineage. That this man who's been working with the plant, with the grandmother spirit of ayahuasca, is the 12th, you know, as far as they, the 12th shaman in his lineage. And that will be passed on. This isn't luck of the draw. Right. <laughs> These are souls incarnating to carry on the sacred work. Those people are few and far between. So when you have that sacredness being, you know, the demand is outweighing the sacred capacity. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, my kid right now is getting the the lecture on drugs has begun. Yeah, And I was just having a conversation yesterday about, you know, Gabor Matei's position on mm-hmm. ayahuasca for people who have addiction issues. And I vehemently disagree. So I... Agree with you more than I disagree. Uh, Sam Harris's Drugs and the Meaning of Life really shaped my thinking on it and convinced me after years of not experimenting or even daring to experiment, convinced me to experiment and go on kind of a journey. I still maintain that it's one of the fastest ways to realize how much more there is to reality. But that's the problem. But that's That's the the problem, problem, Jonathan. It's the fastest way. I've heard ayahuasca being presented as a life hack. That's deplorable. I agree. And you know what the hard work is? The hard work is not doing that. And look, I have no criticism. If you feel called, if you really feel called, if you've done the work and you've found the right source, the right substance, exactly. the right facilitator. Yes. But I'm telling you, the right source, substance, and facilitator are very difficult to find. They're not as easy to find as we are letting ourselves believe. And the I hard agree. work is to say no to the substance and to sit your ass down <laughs> and meditate for months. I don't mean months on end. I don't mean you need to go on a three-year Vipassana treat. Stay with your pain on a steady basis. Do the hard work of tolerance every day. And that's that slower build will bring you to a place that is certain. It's not a life hack to get there. It's longer, but it's less dangerous. Because I've gone down the dangerous path and I had to clean some serious shit up because of 
who I interacted with and the substances that I took, I can tell you if I just had to give it to numbers, took three years out of my life going that way. I should have just meditated. You know, I agree with you. And what I wanted to say was it's the fastest way to get there. And I had a friend who who said, and I really love this metaphor. She's like, I feel like I saw the things that I would have seen if I'd meditated for 10 or 20 years, but I don't understand what I'm seeing. I don't have the tools to cope with what I'm seeing and I don't deserve to see these things. You know, these deep understandings about the universe, I can't cope with in process. And that was kind of my mm. take as well was, wow, what a fast way to clear the blinders, but I have no idea how to cope with that. And as you said, it, it took you three years. It took me about a year, year and a half to come down and cope with that experience, though it was a valuable one. Mm -hmm. And to be at peace with the things that I understood about the nature of consciousness. Oh, this is such a great conversation to have. I mean, what your friend said, so valuable. And you can see, you can understand how tempting this is. Like who wouldn't want to see the sacred geometry, the light rays that have that experience of interconnectedness and God is like, you know, I want to hit just thinking about it. Yeah. It's, it's so important to talk about this, but it takes real maturity to say, I wasn't ready to see that. Now I think I would take an even higher view, a bird's eye view on this and say, but you did it. It was meant to happen. Exactly. What a gift that you're not super <laughs> up because of it. <laughs> you got a glimpse of the divine. And now you can, you know, the next few chapters of the journey is about trying to patch that together. You know, the meaning of that together. And I'm just going to venture to guess little things are or will come your way where you're going to see something in some kind of visionary art. Or you're going to read something in your book and go, that's what I saw. That's what I did. Precisely. <gasps> click, click, click. Uh, isn't it great? Precisely. Yeah, that is precisely the experience I've had. And, and just the levels, you know, as you said, there's a lot of luck. There was also a lot of preparation and a lot of being with the right people at the right time with the right substances until there wasn't, until I got confident and cocky. And then I was in the wrong place with still the right people on the wrong dosage. And that's when everything turned to shit. But the amount of compassion that I now have for people with mental illness and just for other human beings in general mm -hmm. is dramatically changed. And so I consider myself very lucky, but I fully acknowledge that there's a huge element of luck there. But do you believe in luck? Um, How can you believe in luck after you've seen what you've seen? Exactly. I think luck is a, <laughs> is a convenient term for random chance and or divine province going in your way. But it's important to note that luck is in the eye of the beholder, right? Where in the grand scheme of things, what I might consider luck today might be the worst thing to ever happen to me. Yes. Blessing or curse. It's your call. Yes, absolutely. I want to ask you, Danielle, before we wrap up, you told me about a really exciting thing that you're working on before we hit the record button. Tell me about that and uh, tell our audience how they can get involved in that. Well, my current obsession is my next thing. It's called lighter. And one of the things I'm going to look at with people over the course of the year is getting into right relationship with technology. This is the first time I've ever done a year long program. So, you know, I'm highly introverted and very writerly. So I just like to put my books out, <laughs> and stay home, but I'm going to actually like stay engaged with people over the course of 12 months. And this is the program. The content is based on these conversations that I've been having. And I think there's some tracks of craving that are really up for most of us. We want to get off our iPhones. We want more meaning. I think we want to be more deeply devoted to ourselves and to however we define spirit. We are intensely craving more fulfilling friendships. I think for a lot of us, we have this ongoing tension with wanting to arrive. Of course, we all know you don't arrive, but we still want to arrive. So I'm calling that time harmony. I'm going to be working with people about conscious consumption, about nutrition awareness. This isn't about losing weight or getting fit. It's about food activism, really. I think food security is the next big thing. But that and nuclear war that we need to be concerning ourselves with. And 
yeah, it's a 12 month programmatic thing. And here's the thing, because I want to help everybody get into right relationship with technology, it's all print based. So I'm mailing you something every month. There's no, get this, you ready? There's no Facebook group. Love it. <laughs> There's no videos. Sign me up. I want you to go talk to new people, not people online. And, you know, I feel like everything I've done is like the culmination of like all my agony. <laughs> Isn't that the case of every author, though? <laughs> it's the case. This is everything beautiful I've experienced. It's everything that's worked. It's every workshop that I loved and that I walked out of. And I only talk about what's worked in my life. So that's what lighter is. And I have a... Hold on, what's my tagline? Um, Like, I'm in the thick of it. Like, I'm getting off this call with you and I've got to go finish it. Rock on. More sacred, more sanity, less of everything else. That's it. Love that message. Where do people, Danielle, reach out and get involved in that program? I understand we're going to have this episode come out one week before their last opportunity to get involved in this. So I want to make sure that we get the link so there's no back and forth email of people asking. Yeah, I'm everywhere. I mean, specifically, it's daniellelaporte.com slash lighter. But, you know, find me on Instagram, wherever you want. I'll be talking about it for weeks. And... We start, I don't know if I'm going to close it May 20th. May 20th, I think, is the cutoff. That's we. I actually have to start my year on May 21st with everybody. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So, Danielle, it's been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank you for spending your time with us today. I want to ask one last thing, which is, for you, what would you hope people remember most from this episode, the big takeaway? I have one that I want to share, but I, I want to know what yours is. You have one? Uh, what would I want them to remember? Yeah. Oh, love is always the right thing to do. Not the easy thing, but it's always the right thing to do. Yours is better than mine. Oh, <laughs> well, it's just mine. <laughs> What's yours? <laughs> mine was, it all starts with self-love. Oh, yeah. Well, we're bookending each other. You see, it's, well, it's like the masculine and the feminine. Bam. There you go. A nice way to sound up. Danielle Laporte, thank you so much for spending your time with me today. I know you're so busy working on this product launch, but I know our audience really learned a lot and benefited and got in touch with a little bit of their feminine side, which I think is really important as well. <laughs> you were lovely. This was a total treat. Thank you. Take care. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today. But I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.